So yeah, I'm here to talk to you tonight about, um, well, unleashing Spring Boot auto configuration. So actually, first of all, because it's a fairly diverse group, how many people know what Spring Boot is? Okay, most people, that's good, right. Uh, so I'll kind of uh, assume, assume some knowledge then. Um, okay, well, I mean, first of all, what is it? It, at its core, auto configures components present in the class path uh, with uh, possibly some conditions. So it provides a mechanism to, for example, have a Redis auto configuration, which will only actually activate and do anything if, for example, Spring Data Redis has been added to the class path, and if it isn't there, then does nothing. Um, similarly, you can, you can also have conditions around things like properties and the like. So here we've got, we're saying that there's an AOP auto configuration, AOP aspect oriented programming. It's another standard spring component, but you can disable it if you wish by saying, uh, adding another a property for spring AOP auto is false, at which point goes away, does nothing. Um, but of course, if, if, if things are present on the class path and the properties aren't there, it will, it will auto configure. So in a sense, the point is it provides a mechanism for a fairly opinionated framework, um, which, I mean, I suppose it means so Spring, Spring Boot is built on top of Spring. Spring is a very, very flexible sort of dependency injection framework with many different ways of doing a lot of the same things. Spring Boot tends to kind of narrow those things down um, to, well, as I say, give its opinion on exactly how you should go and configure these things and do it. However, we tend to have our own opinions as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, how we can perhaps persuade Spring Boot to adopt some of our opinions as well as its own. Um, it's also a, a mechanism for doing convention over configuration. So uh, a lot of um, the Spring configuration will as make assumptions. So for example, that Redis auto configuration, if it does activate because you've added the libraries on the class path and you've, you've added a Redis client library, then it will automatically start up and automatically assume there is a Redis server on localhost port 6379 with no authentication. On the basis, it's kind of a common thing to do. Um, and therefore, if you are following the, the common convention, you need to do literally nothing more. It'll just work, it's there. Everything has been auto configured for you. Um, of course, it also provides the mechanism to, to override some of these uh, conventions because, of course, we will have our own conventions as well. So um, we're going to talk about that a little. Uh, finally, it removes a lot of boilerplate code. So if you have used Spring in the past without Spring Boot, I'm sure you're probably familiar with death by XML or reams of Java configuration. That again, Spring Boot being opinionated and convention over configuration does away with a lot of that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit first about how it works because we're going to dive into some examples. So first of all, during the early startup of a Spring Boot application, uh, there's, there's a class built into Spring called the Spring Factories Loader, which will go and read a file that, again, by convention, is at meta-inf slash spring.factories. And it will look for this file in every jar on the class path. And contained within this file, and I'll show an example in a minute, um, are entries to say, well, here are the things that should be auto-configured. Uh, here are some uh, initializers. So in, in this case, uh, application context initializers. These are components that get created very early in the startup process, which gives them the ability to either uh, inspect what's going on, potentially change what's going on at a, at a very early stage. Um, secondly, it then uses, this, as I say, this auto-configuration import selector uses much the same mechanism to go and look for uh, classes that have been tagged in the, in the Spring Factories file with enable auto configuration. So that is how it goes and looks and finds all of these things. And we'll be talking about how we, how we can use this ourselves. So when a class is specified like this, it is instantiated and processed as if you had declared a bean yourself, or uh, you can also use the at import annotation to give it a class name. Kind of the same thing. So Spring will kind of work out what to do with it, or possibly not and throw an error. But um, generally speaking, it is the same, the same mechanism as if you had manually um, specified these things. So what this actually means is, of course, we can provide our own. So if we have our own library, then we are able to provide our own um, spring.factories file. And perhaps an example is shown there. So we have a, a Spring Framework application context initializer of our own some initializer class, and then a couple of auto configuration classes there. So I'm going to talk a little bit now uh, about some of the things 
that we can actually do with this. So if we have our own library and our own spring factories, what are perhaps some of the things that we can actually do with the auto configuration mechanism to, uh, to help ourselves? So one of the first problems and perhaps criticisms of Spring Boot and its auto configuration is that it can be a bit magic and in that, for that matter, hard to tell what the hell has just gone on. So you've started up an application and some stuff got auto configured. What stuff? Um, so I should, by the way, say that these code snippets, they're all in a GitHub repo that is uh, on the, the, within the Treatwell GitHub. So uh, I'm sure you'd find it if you look now, but there's also a, a URL at the end. So you'd be able to inspect these a bit later and play with them yourself. But um, yeah, so the first question that, that perhaps we, we can help answer is what auto configuration has actually been applied? So here at, at Treatwell, we've actually written uh, a, an application context initializer that will um, come along and it, well, it actually extends a standard Spring component. Spring will provide reports. So all of, the, all of the odd names, so for example, the condition evaluation report, this is all built into Spring. Spring has all of this, this information. It just doesn't tell you a lot of it by default. So we have um, uh, written a component that will come along, grab the report, and actually then go and dump out at startup all of the things that have been auto-configured, were potentially there, but missed some condition or other, and those that, that um, were kind of unconditional. So I'm just actually gonna hopefully give a live demo of this. So I have a sample application here, which I'm starting up here. Is this text big enough? Would you like it bigger? Yeah, bigger, one more. How about that? Yeah, okay. Um, so we can see here, actually, it's this, this long report here. Somewhat verbose, but what tends to happen, by the way, of course, is that um, by the time you want to repeat, read the report, either your application has failed to start up and you want to know why, or you've been running it for a while, something odd has happened, and you're kind of wondering, well, what did happen at startup? So the, the Spring standard one will only actually print anything out if you enable it in debug mode, but often this can be a bit late. So we tend to just um, print the report out uh, on every startup. So if I scroll right to the top, here, we're gonna see, sorry, I went a bit far. There we go, so, um, I mentioned earlier on there's that AOP auto configuration component, so, if I can find my mouse pointer, there we go. So we can see here, that this one was a match. It matched because it did find uh, the enable aspect J auto proxy class. There was no uh, uh, property saying disable it and so on. So we can see, first of all, A, it matched, it was loaded, and B, why. Uh, this can be useful, particularly if your application fails to start up with a somewhat cryptic error message and you're wondering, well, why do I have to provide a JDBC URL? I didn't want that. But with the report, you ought to be able to then work out why uh, Spring has decided it thinks you should have one of these things. So you can see, as I say, the, the positive matches, and if we scroll all the way down a little bit, then you can see here, these are the negative matches, and I mentioned the Redis auto configuration earlier. Somewhere down here, here we go. So there we go, so that did not match, because indeed, we do not have the Redis operations class and the class path. So I should move that up a bit, shouldn't I? Uh, and therefore, that auto configuration did not apply in this particular application startup. So it's, as I say, it's, it's kind of a, a useful way of, of working out what didn't apply and why. So if you're expecting something to apply, but it apparently didn't, then it can be a, a way of, of helping to, to work out why not. Um, so moving on from that, something else that, that we can use it for is, is validating that application components are, are configured to, I suppose, our, our conventions, our specifications. So um, I have made a somewhat fictitious example here, but it's not a million miles away. Um, so we might, for example, have a requirement that all of our repositories are configured with an app transactional annotation that is not blank, so we know exactly which database we're talking to for everything. As I say, it's a slightly fictitious example, but it hopefully illustrates the kind of thing that we can do. So we've marked it with an auto configuration. It's conditional on the fact that we actually have repositories on the class path. And in this case, it's going to go through, it's going to find any beans that are repositories and check that they have a transactional annotation and that indeed uh, the, the name is not blank. So you'll note that this application started up okay, but if I go over here and I go nobble one of my repositories to remove the, the transactional annotation, then if I go and restart my application again, 
Mm, there we go. And this time round, should have got a fast laptop, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, this time round, it's going to fail. So there we go. So it's, it's going to fail and indeed tell me here that this has been caused by the fact that my uh, validation component fired to say that actually this repository is missing this annotation here. So of course you can use this um, to, to validate any kind of, of configuration. You can check that you have re required components or that, um, as I say, annotations have been configured, database uh, transactions have been configured as, as you wish. Um, and do it, as I say, in an automatic way so that anybody importing the library declaring this component automatically gets the feature. They can disable it if they want, but it has to be a conscious choice. Um, so it kind of allows us to apply our own conventions to the code bases and have them relatively strongly enforced. Um, so uh, next up, uh, we can also um, reconfigure some of the actuator health indicators. So Spring Boot comes with a, a module called Actuators, and one of its features is to provide sort of automated health checks. So the auto configuration allows it to kind of detect what things have been configured. So maybe we have a database connection or a Redis, and it can go and make sure that all of those things are working correctly. But we'll come, we'll come on to exactly what we can do with it in a, in a second, because I just wanted to talk about the Spring event bus. So this is another, another feature of Spring that is particularly useful with auto-configured components. So Spring, Spring provides an event bus to which you can publish and subscribe to events which can be of any type. Um, so the point being that it allows components to send messages to each other without having to be tightly coupled or indeed know whether or not there is the target component that perhaps you might send a message to. Because in the world of auto-configuration, something may or may not have been auto-configured. So if one component wants to kind of talk to another, a convenient way of doing it is to uh, send messages through the event bus. Um, it's worth noting that messaging is synchronous by default. You can reconfigure that um, to use thread pools and so on. But uh, by default, they're synchronous, which also means that any exceptions thrown by event listeners will also be synchronous and propagated back up the stack, which can on occasion be useful if you want to use it to stop something from happening. Um, and Spring itself dispatches uh, many events through to, to manage the application lifecycle and a few other bits and bobs. So um, an example of, of a little listener that I've written for, for this application is essentially picking up every application event that Spring dispatches and just logging it in the logs. So if we go back over to the, uh, the console, uh, and actually I realize I'm going to have to fix this now, aren't I? <laughs> and then... Okay, so we'll start up this time, uh, at which point we'll be able to see some events being dispatched. So, in fact, uh, this is at the bottom, isn't it, which is not great. Sorry about that. Um, actually, I suppose I can just do that. So you can see here that there are a number of log messages here to tell us that the spring event logger has received, well, the type of context refreshed event, there's been a server, web server initialized, there's been an application started, and application is ready, all of which can be responded to in, in different ways. So this particular one is, is just logging out everything. But um, uh, as I was saying before, that one of the things that Spring Boot provides is, is a mechanism for performing health checks. Um, and one of the things that we at Treatwell have done is start looking at when a health check is performed, is the health check up or down? And if it's down, perhaps you want to tell things um, uh, about the fact that it's up or down so that they can respond. So in particular, and I'm afraid I don't have a, the, the code example of this here, so we have applications that process asynchronous messages. So we tend to use RabbitMQ, but this would work equally well with Kafka or uh, pretty much any other messaging platform, that when an application reports itself as down, we will have a component that listens for the health events so that when the application marks itself as down, stop processing things. Because the chances are if the application is down, who knows what your processing is going to do may or may not work, in which case it's a good way of automatically stopping, and then perhaps your application recovers, maybe an underlying database fixes itself, the application comes up again, and then you can start processing messages again. So you can use it as a convenient way of broadcasting the fact that some kind of state has changed. Um, so here, I know, as I say, this is an example of a, a base class of an application health event with 
depending on whether it's up or down, you create an application healthy or unhealthy event. Um, so in here, the, I'm just sort of showing you the, the, the sort of the full bits to wire it all up. We have what's called a health aggregator. This is a fairly standard spring component that we're overriding to call an underlying one. So the standard component does its normal aggregation and then we tell the world about it by publishing an event to the spring event bus. So basically just say, here everybody, everybody who's interested, this is the result of the health check. Um, and thus, so in this case, I've written a listener that simply returns whether the application is up or down, and if it's down, why is it down? What, what underlying components have failed? Um, and thus we sort of wire it all up with this broadcast health aggregator auto configuration, which sets up the components, does it all without the need for uh, any explicit configuration. Again, when the library is imported into any of our TreatWell applications, it just, uh, just uh, immediately fires up. So to demonstrate that, so uh, we've got some blank lines there, which is good. If I go to Firefox over here and hit the, uh, the health endpoint, then we'll see at the moment the application is said to be up, which is good. At which point we can go over here and see that, indeed, the health logging listener has picked up the fact that it is up. Oops. Come on. There we go. Uh, along, by the way, with the spring event logger, also logging other events that have been fired along the way. But uh, for the purpose of this bit, the, the important bit is that the, the logging listener has noticed. Now, I've added my own health indicator that uh, I can poke to say, actually, you're down now, um, which means that if I go to this tab to say, uh, I'm going to basically tell the application, by the way, you're now down. So if I go and rerun the health check, then first of all, you'll now see the status is down because the mutable component says something is wrong. Uh, and if we go and look at the, the log, then once again, the, uh, the listener has picked up the fact that it, it is now down, it was up, and the reason it's down is because the mutable component, but this could just as easily be the Redis component, a database, uh, or indeed you know, any other uh, particular health check component that you, you have written yourselves, then again, they all kind of get auto-wired, picked up. Um, and as I say, in this way, all we're doing here is actually just uh, logging the fact that it was down, but um, we can take further actions and uh, take servers out of uh, pools or stop it processing messages and do whatever else you, you do with it. email people, alerts, whatever. Uh, so, what else? We can apply standard components. So, um, it doesn't have to just be you know, configuration and so on and so forth. You can essentially auto, uh, auto configure in standard components. So, uh, I mean, again, I've made a slightly fictitious example. Perhaps your load balancer software does not like the standard spring boot format of health logging and wants a custom REST controller that is available at the custom slash health endpoint perhaps, with a specific format of status pipe, some details or something. Um, and in this way, that the, the controller can just be auto-wired in, uh, sorry, auto-configured in, um, and will therefore be present in all applications that import the library, use the auto-configuration. Um, so it's a convenient way of, again, applying your own conventions, your own opinions about how some of these things should work. Uh, so, I mean, in actual fact, this is the Spring Factories from that sample application that I was running. Uh, so it shows us that we've got two initializers, one for uh, the report, one for the logger, and then we've got three auto configurations, which will just apply to any application that imports the library. And I think that's it.